Michael Chong has brought forward a reform act aimed at empowering parliamentarians. His proposals call for restoring local control over party nominations, the strengthening of caucus, and a renewed focus on the accountability of party leaders. And here now to tell us why he thinks this power dynamic needs changing, Michael Chong, the Conservative MP for Wellington Halton Hills, and it's good to see you again. Good to be here. Steve. Welcome back to TVO. Let me just read a bit of an excerpt from the bill here because this is what this is all about. The Reform Act, you tell us, is an effort to strengthen Canada's democratic institutions by restoring the role of elected members of Parliament in the House of Commons. The proposals in the Reform Act would reinforce the principle of responsible government. It would make the executive more accountable to the legislature and ensure that the party leaders maintain the confidence of their caucuses. The Reform Act proposes three main reforms, restoring local control over party nominations, strengthening caucus as decision-making body, and reinforcing the accountability of party leaders to their caucuses. The Reform Act amends two acts of Parliament, the Canada Elections Act and the Parliament of Canada Act. Before we get into details, let's just tar talk uh, overarching philosophy here. What's happening in Parliament right now that you feel requires this kind of remedy? Well, I think it's clear that as a result of changes that have taken place over decades, that the ability of individual members of Parliament to represent their individual unique constituencies in the House of Commons has weakened um, to the benefit of party leadership. And that's true of all the parties in the House of Commons. And it hasn't come a result of any one government or any one party. It's the result of rule changes that have taken place over the last 40 years. So the bill is simply an attempt to rebalance that power structure. You know there are lots of people who don't believe the last thing you said. They do believe things are different under this Prime Minister and your party. And that's one reason why this bill, they believe, is even more necessary than normal. You're not buying that? No. Uh, in fact, uh, the bill would not come into force for years. Uh, the coming into force clause was put into the bill so that it wouldn't come into force until after the next election, precisely because it's, if, if the issue were the current leaders of the three parties currently in the House of Commons, then the, the solution becomes simple. Change the leadership of the three parties. But that's not going to fix the problem. The problem has been long-standing. It's a result of the way the rules are structured, and that's why the rules need to change. The Greens would want me to say four leaders in the House of Commons right now. I'm not sure the BQ leader is in the House. Actually, he just stepped down, so he's definitely not there. If enacted after the 2015 election, how would Parliament be different? What it would do is it would give MPs more autonomy uh, to stand on principle or to stand on matters of importance to their constituency. Um, regardless of what the party position was. And so it would great, create a greater deal of autonomy for MPs to exercise uh, their rights in the House and to represent their constituencies. So I think you'd lead, it'd lead to less partisanship and a more balanced parliament. I think the people's wishes would be better reflected in a parliament like that. A more balanced parliament. It suggests parliament is unbalanced right now? I think so. I think there's too much power concentrated in the party leaders' offices. Um, and particularly of the party leader in power simply because they have the full force of the state, the full force of the government of Canada behind their office. Um, so this would rectify some of that imbalance. At the end of the day, if these reforms are put into place, we would still have immensely powerful party leaders and an immensely powerful prime minister who would make thousands of appointments, um, make uh, appointments to cabinet, uh, make appointments to crown corporation boards, crown, cor crown corporation heads, courts, all courts all deputy ministers, still immensely powerful leader system, just not quite as powerful as it is today. One of the things you've said is you want us to get back a little more to the core of what responsible government is supposed to be. Now, responsible government doesn't just mean the government being responsible. This is a term that goes back hundreds of years. What do you mean by this? Well, responsible government means that the government, in other words, the cabinet and the prime minister, is not responsible to an unelected appointed governor or governor general, but rather to the people's elected representatives in the legislature, the House of Commons. And that's the whole concept of responsible government. This wasn't always the case in Canada. Um, prior to the 1840s, um, the cabinet, the government, was responsible to the unelected, un unelected and appointed governor. Uh, after the 1840s, with the introduction of responsible government, the cabinet and the prime minister now have, are responsible to the legislature. That accountability mechanism is incredibly important because unlike republics like the United States, we don't have a formal division of powers. And so how the legislature and the executive branches work together and hold each other in balance is incredibly important. We are one of many Westminster type 
parliamentary systems around the world. Is ours any more out of balance, do you think, than any of the others? I think so. Um, it's been true that all Westminster parliamentary democracies have gone to stronger leader systems in recent decades. Just a trend of the party, just a trend of television and, and leadership campaigns. Um, that being said, I think ours is unusually imbalanced. And so, for example, we are the only Western democracy where, by law, in the Elections Act, the party leaders have a veto over each party candidate in each, uh, in each district. And that doesn't exist in other Westminster parliamentary systems. So if you want to run again in 2015, do you want to run again in 2015? I do. You do, in your riding that you currently represent. That's right. You still need Stephen Harper to sign off on your nomination, is that right? That's right. Every single party uh, candidate must have the written approval of the party leader before the local Elections Canada officer will print their name on the ballot. It's you as simple that, as that. You think that's wrong? I think that's wrong. Should anybody have to sign off on it? I think so, um, but I think that should be restricted to local control, and that's what the bill proposes to do. You've received, I've got to say, a ton of feedback on this. I mean, the, the reaction from the public, most of which has been actually quite positive, uh, has really been something, so you've obviously tapped into something, but it hasn't been unanimously in favor. And here's a guy named David Frum, who you may know. I'm sure you read this in the National Post. He writes, the votes of those backbenchers sustain the government. Stray musings by those backbenchers can doom it. A successful parliamentary leader is therefore likely to be a, quote, control freak for exactly the same reason that the manager of a nuclear reactor is likely to be, because the consequences of error can be so horrible. And Stephen Harper has been a very successful parliamentary leader. The Reform Act is a grant of power to each party's most irresponsible and refractory MPs. It is an invitation to parliamentarians to look even more inward than they already do. It purports to emancipate MPs. In reality, it will simply reorient them away from their national party leadership, which in turn is accountable to a broad national party membership and towards activists in their constituencies. What do you think? Well, I, I don't agree. I think that what the bill will do is it will create stronger grassroots democracy because what it will do is it will restore local control over party nominations, thereby more closely connecting the elected member of parliament with their local party membership. Um, it doesn't affect in any way, shape, or form uh, the current power of parties and their members to elect a leader. It doesn't affect the current party power uh, and the power of its members to review a leader. All it simply does is, is say that caucus has the right uh, today to review a party leader. Those rules have never been written down, and the bill simply proposes to put them down in writing so that they're clear and available to everyone. You've been specific. You have said here that a review of the leader can take place if just 15% of caucus members support a process of leadership review. 15% of, let's say it's your caucus right now, which is 162 members, that's 24 MPs. Mm -hmm. That would be to trigger the vote. To trigger the vote, right. That's not very many, right? No, it's not. And uh, that's the standard in use in other Westminster democracies. The power is used judiciously because you're, you have to be accountable for using that power. Um, the review, the removal of the leader still would be something that would require 50% plus one of the caucus members. But if you look across the floor at the Liberal caucus right now, basically what you're saying is if there's five cranks in there who don't like Justin Trudeau, they can trigger a vote. That's right. Um, and as I th said before, I think, it's, I think the rule will be used very judiciously. I think that any time uh, you, you trigger something like this, you're going to create a lot of attention and a lot of controversy. And not only that, you have to be accountable back to the party members in your local district. And if they aren't supportive of what you do, you will be reviewed at the next nomination meeting and possibly removed as the party candidate. But you could understand how a leader would say, boy, 15% floor is a pretty small floor. That's going to lead to endless loop after loop leadership reviews. Uh, that's not true. If you look at uh, how the U rule has been used in other parliaments, uh, like those in the UK or Australia, uh, they only really come in, it only is really utilized during leadership crises. And I think the big difference between how they operate and how we operate is this. When we have leadership crises, like we've seen in the Martin Kretchen years, like we saw during the, uh, the, the final days of the Canadian Alliance and progressive conservative parties, we tend to have drawn out protracted leadership crises where months, if not years, are taken up with inter, in, inner fighting by party members and caucus members. 
with these sorts of rules on caucus leader review put down on paper, made clear to everybody and made clear to all, you end up with quick decisions, either to sustain the leader or to remove the leader and begin uh, the party's leadership race amongst its membership. One of your former colleagues in the Conservative caucus, who now, of course, sits as an independent because he left, because he was fed up with how little democracy he says there is in the party, Brent Rathgaber from uh, Alberta wrote this. I think Michael Chong's bill is going to have a rough ride as it goes through the parliamentary process. I'm happy that members from all parties have expressed openness to it, in some corners even some support. But I think at the end of the day, the party leaders are going to have a difficult time supporting this, and the cynic in me suspects it might find a fate not dissimilar to my private member's bill. This is what Mr. Rathgaber told the Hill Times last week. The government will pretend to support it and therefore vote in favor of it at second reading and then send it to a committee and gut it. If passed, Bill C-559 would no longer allow party leaders to sign nomination forms for candidates, something Mr. Rathgaber said is why backbench MPs are reticent to speak out against party lines and policies for fear of not getting the leader's endorsement at the next election. I mean, you've got to admit, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge obstacle to you getting this through, right? Well, I'm relentlessly optimistic, and I think that the fact that the bill got so much attention just on its first reading, on its introduction into the House of Commons, not just from members of the public, but also from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, is cause for optimism. I think there is widespread acknowledgement amongst academics, amongst the public, amongst former politicians that the system is not working as it should, that there is a power imbalance between the party leadership structures and between caucus members. And that needs to be righted, and that it's not a result of any one party or any one leader, but as a result of rule changes that have taken away power from the people's elected representatives. This bill will fix it. I think it's the start of a long conversation about how to renew Parliament, and I'm optimistic that we can achieve these changes. You are partly there, right? Like Tom Mulcair, the leader of the opposition, has said not only is he in favor of it, but he'll allow his caucus a free vote. Justin Trudeau, leader of the Liberals, has said he'll allow his caucus a free vote, although I don't think he's made up his own mind yet on how he will vote. Have you talked to Stephen Harper about this? I've not spoken with the Prime Minister. I've spoken with uh, one of the ministers responsible for the bill, Pierre Polyev, the Minister for Democratic Reform. We had a good discussion about the bill. What's he saying? Well, he said the government's going to carefully review it. Uh, they do have some concerns. they always say when they don't well, want to answer I, your question. I, I've got, I, I think it's reasonable for the government to take a couple months to review the bill. Look, this is, these are, this is a very short bill. It's only six pages. And on the surface, these are seemingly simple changes. But I think they would have profound impacts on our parliament. So I think it's entirely reasonable for the government to take a couple months to consider all the implications of the bill, to get advice from the Privy Council office, and then to make their decision on their position on the bill. Can you tell us one cabinet minister who will support it? Well, I expect the cabinet will take a position as a group. Cabinet confidence is always done as a group, and I expect that it will be a single cabinet position on the bill. I can't tell you anybody who's in favor of it, but I do know at this point Peter Van Loan's against it. He's told you that, I imagine, right? I haven't spoken to well, Peter about the bill. He's been public about that. Yeah, but I expect the cabinet will take a single position on the bill. A single position against the bill? On the bill. Uh, on the bill. On so the you're bill. not sure if it's for or against I'm it. I'm not sure. I, I think they're going to take some time to consider it. You go to caucus still, right? I mean, Absolutely. I know, I, uh, do you have an opportunity at caucus, or have you yet to stand up and ask the Prime Minister what do you think about this? Well, the Prime Minister was in Africa last week um, after the bill was uh, introduced in the House um, because of the funeral for Nelson Mandela. Right. So I've not had an opportunity to speak with him yet. Will you? I will. You definitely want to do that in caucus sometime. Yes. I'd like to be there to see that. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I can, though. Okay, Michael Chong, the Conservative MP for Wellington Halton Hills. Good of you to come into TVO tonight and help us out with this. Thanks for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.